Welcome to the Jones Seminar Series today. It's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Randall Hoffman, uh, Assistant Investigator at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research, who's being hosted by uh, Professor Margie Ackerman. Um, he is uh, coming to us with a background in uh, biology and genetics. He did his undergraduate in Texas A&M in genetics and PhD in biology with Susan Linguist at uh, MIT, graduated in 2010. From there, he transitioned directly to, as, to an independent research career at UT Southwestern Medical Center as an independent postdoctoral fellow, uh, securing NIH funding to build a research program that uses yeast genetics, molecular biology, and biochemistry to explore the contributions of protein aggregation to gene regulation and phenotypic heterogeneity. Uh, he discovered that self-propagating protein aggregates known as prions function to enforce cell fate commitment in organisms ranging from budding yeast to humans. In 2015, he became an assistant, the assistant investigator that he currently holds the position at at the Stowers Institute in Kansas City, uh, and he investigates how nucleon-limited protein phase transitions drive both function and dysfunction in biological systems. Uh, so today, I will let him introduce his Jones Seminar Series, but it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margie, for having me here. This has been a real pleasure for me. Uh, I'm interacting with people and talking about things that I haven't talked about, in some cases, ever before. Um, and that's been uh, really nice. So I was told that it would be a diverse crowd. Um, I normally give lectures to biologists, so my sort of knee-jerk title that I sent to Carissa was this one, Living and Dying by Prions, um, and, I, and I meant for that to convey the breadth of biological phenomena that we work on, but then I realized who I'm talking to, and I thought maybe this is an opportunity to talk about things that are more mechanism-based. So then I gave this title instead, like a day later, um, Quinary Structure Kinetically Controls Protein Function and Dysfunction. And this was the title for the paper that we had submitted for the work that I'm going to talk about. And now that I've gotten the reviews back, I learned that using the words quinary structure and kinetic control don't always make friends for me. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to back off of that one. And now I'm giving you what I think is the final title, which is Deconstructing Nucleation Barriers to Reveal the Physical Basis of Prion Behavior. And so, you guys undoubtedly are familiar with prions. Um, I like to think about it from a very simple perspective. And, uh, and we can back up a little bit and talk about the basic problem that defines prions, and that is how information in a linear sequence of amino acids drives the collapse of that molecule into some functional conformation represented up here. Particularly, I'm interested in proteins that have a bifurcation in this pathway, such that usually they'll form the functional protein, but occasionally they will form an alternative conformation that then feeds back on the system and, uh, uh, and corrupts new molecules in this pathway, driving them into the same conformation. And so, prion, of course, is a portmanteau of proteinaceous and virion. It was initially described, or, or conceptualized, rather, to describe a group of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And these have a long history, beginning in the 1950s, well, be way before that, actually, but first really studied clinically uh, in the 1950s in the case of Kuru. This was a devastating disease inflicting uh, indigenous tribe of New Guinea. And they said, Pretty much the exact same disease cropped up again in the 1990s with the mad cow disease epidemic. Um, so these are really devastating diseases. They were the subject of a lot of attention. Now, the mad cow disease epidemic is, is under control. However, the concepts that we learned about what drives prions to be infectious, or, or, or what allows them to be infectious, or to even transmit between cells, uh, turns out to be responsible for some of the most common neurodegenerative diseases we know, 
including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS. All of these diseases, at some level, have the same etiology. There's a molecular transition allowing a protein to propagate an altered state into other cells, at least within a cell, sometimes into other cells. And whereas the canonical prion, or the original prion, prion protein, or PRP, was the only one of these thought to be capable of spreading between organisms, between humans, even that boundary is beginning to blur. For example, uh, amyloid beta pathology associated with Alzheimer's has now been documented in very rare clinical circumstances to transmit between individuals. So this is really a large gray area. There's something very fundamental ab about proteins, about lots of proteins that allow this to happen. And now there's a lot of interest in understanding um, just how it happens. So beyond that, uh, I'm not an MD. I actually work on um, you know, very basic biology. And I'm drawn to what I consider a brighter side of prions. And this bright side has its roots in yeast genetics. When um, a researcher by the name of Reed Wickner was studying these really remarkable traits in yeast that were heritable in a non-Mendelian manner, um, propagated to all the organisms, all the cells um, in the progeny. And the only solution he could come up with for what's driving this behavior is something analogous to a prion. So it's a protein that somehow encodes heritable information independently of nucleic acid. And so he broadened the concept of prion to include proteinaceous inheritance. And I'm going to show you an example of one of these. Uh, this is a prion that I discovered. Um, what you're looking at here is, whoa, now you're looking at nothing. Here we are. So what you're looking at here is two colonies of the Chilean wine yeast, L1374. On the left is this rather nondescript yeast colony. It's rather boring. It's this hemispherical shape. Uh, this is a unicellular growth form of yeast. On the right, we have a multicellular growth form. Okay. You can see this is uh, arguably an entirely different organism from this one. However, they are genetically identical. Not only that, but they were grown side by side on the exact same plate in my lab. So they are, there's, no phenotyp there's no environmental change that gave rise to these entirely different growth forms. And it turns out that the only causal molecular distinction between these two colonies is the conformation of a single protein. That protein, called MOT3, is a transcription factor. In its functional state, it represses about 200 genes that when derepressed, as happens in an aggregated form of MOT3, give rise to this phenotype. So the founding cell of this colony had acquired, spontaneously acquired, in this self-templating, self-inactivating form of MOT3 that then propagated into every daughter cell as the colony was growing, such that the whole collection of cells now exhibits this emergent phenotype. So a lot of what we know about prions is due to work in yeast. In fact, the prion hypothesis was first proven in yeast. And this is a gross oversimplification of how it works. Uh, most prions, prion-forming proteins, start off their lives as intrinsically disordered proteins. So they don't really have a stable native configuration. As a consequence, that allows them to explore all kinds of other con uh, conformations. Eventually, they will inevitably acquire a, a nucleating conformation that then templates uh, the deposition of new proteins. So you have an increasingly stable arrangement of the molecules. This forms a one-dimensional polymer, a one-dimensional crystal, that then fragments, uh, because it's one-dimensional, can fragment into smaller pieces that then passively disseminate in the cytosol when the cell divides. And so these little pieces then serve as seeds to template the deposition of newly synthesized molecules uh, thereby perpetuating the process indefinitely. Now, what makes this phenomenon so intriguing to me is that uh, every prion-forming protein effectively encodes a molecular switch at the cellular level or even at the organism level. Um, normally, 
the proteins hang out in this state, but that's metastable. So this is where most of the activity happens, but it's fundamentally metastable. Again, eventually it will form this state, and this state perpetuates indefinitely. So you have this really this bimodal uh, distribution of cells containing prion. And that's, um, um, and we're intrigued by uh, situations where that either functions or causes pathology, explaining a lot of the phenomena that biologists are generally interested in, like life and death. So in the case of um, the canonical prions, this single molecular event kills not only the individual, but any other individual that happens to acquire these particles. Again, it's coming from this, this infinitesimally small, low probability event. I just showed you an example where that transition uh, causes cells to change growth forms between a unicellular and multicellular growth form. It's a very fundamental biological transition. And then my colleague, Kosick C at Stowers, has made a really fascinating discovery that at least in some organisms, the process of long-term memory storage, or when the, the seminal event that causes a long-term memory appears to be driven by a nucleated transition, like a prion, at the synapse. So cells clearly are taking advantage of this process. It's not just causing death. And then the other thing is that because it's all driven by protein folding or protein misfolding, it stands to be intrinsically sensitive to environmental stresses, things that can um, perturb the soluble state or, uh, or, or the aggregated state. Uh, things like the environment, stresses, um, signaling networks, all of these things can impinge on nucleation or propagation um, and thereby provide a mechanism whereby cells can respond heritably to environmental changes. So this is very much a quasi-Lamarckian form of inheritance. And we know this. We can induce prions. We can induce permanent heritable changes in cells just by stressing them. And they remain genetically identical. So what really drives the work in my lab, at least the work that I'm going to tell you about today, um, focuses on this seminal nucleation event. So how does nucleation happen in the first place in the cell? And of course, we're interested in all the various functional uh, uh, consequences of nucleation, the dysfunctional consequences that I'll talk about later. And then if we can really understand it uh, at a physical level, we will be able to predict, hopefully, what are the sequence features and structural features that allow it to happen. Um, and how does the cell control that? So, um, what are the molecular events that give rise to nucleation? So what I've shown you in the very first slide was this process of protein misfolding. So the nucleating event somewhere in this regime down here requires an improbable molecular fluctuation in the structure, a conformational fluctuation in the structure of the protein. And that improbability dictates the size of the nucleation barrier, the, the, the um, amount of time one has to wait on average for it to happen. But moreover, um, you'll notice that these things are polymers, right? So these are aggregates. They're actually a phase transition. It's not just a conformational change, but it's also a change in the density of the protein and so simultaneous with a conformational fluctuation, there has to be a density fluctuation. So monomers, even if they're achieving the right conformation, have to achieve the right conformation while they're on top of each other, effectively. So it's the improbability of both of these fluctuations that cause the height, of the, that, that determine the height of the nucleation barrier. And now important for this talk, if I want to know what underlies nucleation, I want to be able to distinguish these two contributions. And so the way we chose to do that is to take advantage of the fact that this molecular uh, fluctuate, the conformational fluctuation is independent of concentration. So this is determined by the number of degrees of freedom in the polypeptide or polypeptides themselves and their fold. Whereas this density fluctuation fundamentally is, uh, uh, scales, the probability scales with concentration. Um, the larger the critical cluster of molecules to nucleate, the sh more sharply nucleation will depend on concentration. And so something that's been holding uh, prion, amyloid, 
uh, biochemists holding them back for a long time is an in vitro approach where they're working with non-physiological sizes or volumes. And that may not seem that relevant. If you have a physiological buffer and a physiological concentration, shouldn't the structure of the protein uh, be the same as it is in the cell? And it turns out that because structure can be rate limited by nucleation, and the probability of nucleation scales with the number of molecules in the system, not just the concentration, but the number, then large volumes like these will deterministically acquire a nucleated state. And so for many proteins, what you see in a test tube is an amyloid or an aggregate, even though that's not relevant in the much, much smaller pop molecular population size that happens in vivo. And so now, if you start reducing the volume of the reaction, you eventually get to a point where it's no longer deterministic. It's probabilistic. And so if you go very small, you'll see that some reactions nucleate, and others, so it's spontaneous or sporadic, don't. Uh, so taking advantage of these small volumes, we can also imagine scaling the degree of supersaturation. So now we can look at the concentration dependence and look at the function or the fraction of reactions that have nucleated as a function of concentration and thereby determine the two uh, uh, the two fluctuations, conformation versus density, that comprise the nucleation barrier. So to do this, obviously, you need lots and lots of reactions. A um, 150 microliter reaction in a microplate is still many orders of magnitude larger than the volume of a cell. And so we wanted to go even more physiological, and we envisioned two ways of doing this. One is via micro droplets. So you can use microfluidics or other approaches to create tiny little reactions, thousands and thousands of little reactions that are individually compartmentalized. However, the problem there is that it's still an artificial system. You're still taking the protein away from all of the cellular factors, the putative post-translational modifications, the binding partners, et cetera. And we thought, well, why do we want to do that when we have a perfect reaction vessel in our hands? And that is just use cells. So can we effectively make a cell the closest uh, approximation of a test tube we can imagine. And so that's what we set out to do. We had three challenges to do that. The first is we really needed to ensure that every single cell was an independent reaction. And so, as I mentioned, I'm working with prions, so the defining feature of these is the ability to propagate between cells, which means that cells inherently are not independent reactions. Oh, man, I keep doing that. So this can happen in two ways. Um, the particles can somehow escape a cell, get into another cell, leading its proteins to aggregate. Or the cell can divide. If the particle is not deadly, the cell can divide, uh, resulting in two versions that have dependent, uh, that, nu that, that, that both arose from a single nucleation event. So we turn to yeast cells for this approach because yeast cells despite ours and other labs' best efforts, do not take in prions spontaneously. This is owing to their very thick, rigid cell wall. So that's great, because it limits this mechanism of transmission. Um, we further took advantage of the fact that the yeast cell cycle is the best characterized of any other organism. Um, and there are tools available. Uh, in fact, we constructed this tool, based on the available literature, to inducibly arrest cell division whenever we turned our protein on. So now, uh, and specifically, or, or um, importantly, we did that without arresting protein translation. So the cells are growing happily, translating proteins. They're just no longer dividing. So we're kind of turning them into little beach balls here. You can see how much larger they are. OK, so now we have independent reactions that are on the order of femtoliters. Um, then we needed to quantify uh, not only the concentration of our protein of interest in each of these reactions, each of these cells, um, but also how much the proteins have stuck together. And so we looked through a lot of different approaches, uh, and we decided on FRET. So FRET, you're probably all familiar with, um, occurs between two complementary fluorophores. This is a particular form of FRET, um, where uh, excitation of one fluorophore will transmit that energy non-radiatively to a complementary fluorophore 
uh, in a distance-dependent manner, so only when the fluorophores are extremely close together. Uh, and then that results in emission from the other fluorophore. If the two are not close together, then the green protein emits instead of the red. Uh, moreover, um, in doing this, you can not only quantify uh, the extent of self-assembly between, or of, of assembly between proteins, but by directly exciting the red fluorophore, you can quantify how much red protein is in the reaction. Now, this is limiting because we're looking at self-assembly, and we don't want to have to make two different fluorophores. So there's a technical limitation there. Um, while simultaneously controlling their ratios for optimal FRET, moreover, we can only directly determine the concentration of the red fluorophore. We can't directly determine the concentration of the green fluorophore. So we needed a way to link the green and red fluorophores. So we created a system of FRET that we called amphifluoric FRET, where we took, simply took advantage of the fact that there are photoconvertible proteins, in this case, Ineos 3.1, that starts out green, and then when absorbing violet, uh, violet light, converts to red in a probabilistic manner. These two uh, fluorophores are actually fantastic FRET pairs. And all we do now is limit the amount of excitation such that every cell has the same ratio of red and green. Right? It's probabilistic. So it doesn't matter what the concentration is. Um, and we get roughly half and half. Right? But the important thing, again, is that it doesn't matter what the concentration is. It's exactly the same ratio in every cell. And then the final thing is, again, we want to know how nucleation changes as a function of concentration. So we don't want to have to create a different culture uh, in, in incremental fashion for every concentration. We could do that. But it'd be much easier to take advantage of the fact that we're simply quantifying concentration directly. So we needed a way to rapidly create a very broad distribution of concentrations in our culture. We took advantage of an episomal plasmid in yeast. We made a, a tweak. To the, to the existing plasmid, um, such that uh, it, it can go upwards of 200 copies per cell, but it's asymmetrically inherited, such that in a single culture, you get greater than 200-fold variation in copy number. And all those copies are expressing the exact same fusion construct. So that gives us a broad range of concentrations. Ultimately, this is the workflow we've come up with. We grow our cells. We'll first clone our protein of interest into yeast cells in this plasmid. Uh, we simultaneously induce, the cell, uh, induce cell cycle arrest while turning on the protein. So we accumulate a broad range of concentrations in, each, in these cells. During that time, assembly happens uh, in a concentration-dependent manner. We then use limiting photoconversion of the culture to get this equal ratio of red and green. We then subject that culture to imaging flow cytometry to measure right, as well as the concentration of protein. Again, we can measure the red protein, but because we know the ratio of red and green, we know the total protein concentration, the total protein intensity. Because we're using imaging flow cytometry, we also know the volume of the cell. And we take advantage of the fact that, uh, that yeast organelle volume scales with total volume, so we can determine the cytosolic concentration of the cell, and thereby the concentration, uh, the cytosolic volume, thereby the concentration of the protein in the cytosol. All right. And then ultimately, we look at our distribution of cells uh, generated by flow cytometry, and we look at the fraction of cells that have a nucleated state versus, the fraction, uh, versus concentration. OK, so now there's the assay. And you'll have to take my word for it for now that it works. I'll show you that in a second. But now I wanted to turn it uh, to the variety or uh, the spectrum of nucleated protein phases in biology and see what can we learn about them. And so there's quite a few. I mentioned bona fide prions and yeast prions. Uh, more recently, we discovered the first functional prion in humans. Uh, this is actually the, well, we didn't discover it, but we discovered that it acts like a prion. This is the inflammasome. And then there's also a group of proteins, a very large group of proteins, it seems, that undergo a phase transition. Um, uh, that is not crystalline, not amyloid in nature, but rather has a liquid-like character, liquid-liquid phase separation. Um, and the important thing is that a lot of the proteins that have this behavior functionally have this behavior. So this is a mechanism for compartmentalization of the cell in a non-membrane-dependent way. Uh, the same proteins are also responsible for many of these phenomena. 
And so we realized that really what's limiting them fundamentally is the size of the nucleation barrier. So um, these non-membrane bound organelles or these liquid phases occur in virtually all cells under the right conditions. So there's no appreciable kinetic barrier to assembly of these phases. However, as you go up on the spectrum, you, um, you encounter increasingly rare states. Uh, and so we reason that maybe what's controlling this biology, to a large extent, is just the probability of nucleation. So let's focus on the inflammasomes. Uh, so this is some of the biology here. I, don't, I hope you can see this. So this is um, a normal mammalian cell. This is actually a HEC293 cell, so maybe not so normal. But in any case, this is how it works, we think, in vivo. The protein, uh, which is not showing up, the protein is called ASC. It exists in a soluble, diffuse form all the time. So your cells have this protein in a soluble form. Um, and then in response to some stimulus, some noxious agent or some pathogen that gets in the cell, that protein will semi-stochastically switch to exactly one dot in every cell, extremely rapidly. When that switch occurs, uh, pyroptosis ensues, so the cells undergo programmed cell death. And so this looks an awful lot like an irreversible phase transition, a prion-like transition. Um, we wanted to study the nucleation barrier underlying this. And so uh, the domain responsible for inflammasome assembly is this pyrin domain of ASC. We simply fused it to our MEOS 3.1 protein, and this is what the distribution looks like. So this is our AMFRET distribution. Here we're quantifying ratiometric FRET, so that's the level of FRET normalized by the concentration of the protein in that cell. And here is the concentration of the protein in arbitrary units in this case. And what you can see is that there's this really intriguing bimodal distribution. So there's most cells have no fret, and then there's some region of concentration where the cells generally are either in this no fret state or a high fret state. And there's a few cells that are transitioning here. And so that suggests that this the state of the protein, or the state of these cells, is not dependent on the concentration of the protein. In these cases, it's dependent on some uh, kinetic barrier. When we make a mutation in the pyrin domain of ASC that blocks inflammation in human cells, we block the transition to this high fret state. And furthermore, if we look at the full length protein, so the full length protein is actually a tandem dimer of two death domains, we see incredible bimodality now in this case. So again, you have this region of overlap, but now this population that's transitioning is entirely gone. And we're just taking a single time point, but what we deduce from that is that the cells move incredibly fast between this population and this population, such that we don't see them. We don't catch them in action. Um, again, this is imaging flow cytometry, so we can also take advantage of the, the images we see and actually um, determine independently of FRET how the protein is localized. And so in these cases, in this bottom population, we see that it's entirely diffuse. In the top population, we see different aggregates, um, single dots in this case, as expected for this protein. And then we took a move. We wanted to see, is this really like an instantaneous transition? So we turn the protein on. We're watching it. We're watching it. It's clearly supersaturated. And then within a single frame, it's all a single dot. Um, and we plotted many such cells over time. And we see that nucleation uh, is, not is not just dependent on concentration. There's some stochasticity above a certain concentration. Um, again, our assay is dependent uh, on a single construct for each protein. And we were really fascinated by these death domains. Um, because they are critically involved in many neurodegenerative diseases, autoinflammatory diseases, and cancer. And we thought, well, this is really cool. So is this partially a mechanism whereby uh, time alone determines um, activation of these proteins, thereby giving rise to age-associated diseases? 
And so we wanted to screen them. We had found the only two proteins that do this. We screened them all. There was 107 domains in total. Um, and we found that a large fraction of them, at least 31, undergo these bimodal transitions, suggesting that um, this may be the mechanism of activation. Um, moreover, uh, we looked at the interaction network, and the proteins in blue, the blue dots, are much more uh, interconnected than the proteins in red dots. Um, we think suggesting that this is a mechanism of information flow between proteins. So is it possible that nucleation of one of these death domains um, by interacting with another one induces its nucleation? So are we getting signal propagation between different pathways in innate immunity? Uh, and that turns out to be true for at least two of them. And this was work that didn't come from our lab, but we're following up on it now. And so what happens is some of these proteins, so here's this interaction between MAVs and this uh, DDX58, or Rig I. Rig I is a sensor protein in response to a single molecule of viral RNA. The cell mounts uh, an, uh, an immune response, um, cytokine production, often leading to programmed cell death. And so it's long been fascinating how a cell can make such a dramatic change in response to a single molecule. Right? And it turns out that that single molecule, because it's polyvalent, acquires, um, um, is bound by multiple molecules of Rig I, the sensor protein, and that sensor protein then scaffolds the nucleus for MAVs. And so that nucleating event, again, is the key trigger from which the cell does not return. Um, ASK works the same way in response to multiple upstream pathogen sensor proteins. Uh, and in the case of ASK, it even goes one step further that we know of. So the ASK polymer then serves as a multivalent scaffold to nucleate caspase activation. So um, pyroptosis is driven by a sequential nucleation of NLRP3, ASK, procaspase 1. So we wanted to know, um, are these nucleation events functionally regulated? Um, we don't know what the effector molecules are, or the ligands are, for many of these pathways, for many of these proteins. Uh, so we instead engineered a system. We replaced the putative multivalent scaffold with a constitutively self-assembling protein called MUNS. Uh, it's from a virus. It always forms a very tight but dynamic um, punctum in the cytosol. And so we simply uh, performed our assay where this fusion protein was expressed in trans, realizing, uh, rationally uh, um, thinking that that scaffold could then serve as the nucleus for activation, and it should do it in a template-specific manner. And so this is what um, a subset of that screen looks like. So here we're looking at the AMFRET distributions of each of these proteins in columns, and then we're pairing them with this uh, multimeric nucleator protein in rows. And we knew that MAVs, that Rig I specifically nucleates MAVs, and in fact, uh, in the absence of Rig I, we see this bimodal distribution. In the presence, we see absolutely no supersaturated cells. Likewise, for HAD S, we see a specific response to its cognate nucleator, and for ASK, a specific response to its cognate nucleator. So we have really nice uh, sequence and structure specificity from these different interacting proteins. Um, so, what am I doing on time? So, I better go on, actually. All right. Um, we think this is potentially a basis for um, auto inflammatory diseases but that remains to be explored. Okay, now I want to switch gears a little bit and tell you about a uh, different series of proteins, and uh, I previously told you about inflammasomes and death domains, and now I want to cover all three of these classes of proteins. As I mentioned, uh, uh, prions are driven by intrinsically disordered proteins, and I mentioned that many of those proteins are now known to form a variety of different liquid liquid uh, droplets or liquid compartments in the cell. Uh, 
Um, so prion-like, we call these generally prion-like sequences, initially because the yeast prions looked a lot, uh, looked quite similar in sequence composition. Um, many of them now do this. And then the emerging paradigm is that perhaps pathological aggregates um, arise from some transition happening within or on, or in any case around, these liquid compartments. And so what is the relationship between these different phase transitions? So this is a, an example of a couple of these prion-like proteins. This is the canonical prion protein in yeast, this is sub-35. Um, I've color-coded the polar uncharged residues in green. And you can see that the uh, protein is largely composed of these residues. That composition allows it, or prevents it from forming a stable native state, which then, of course, allows it to access these amyloid conformations that we see in vitro, and that manifest as prions in vivo. More recently, um, computationally, people have found that this kind of sequence character is found in hundreds of human proteins. And this is the example of FUSE, which is an important protein in ALS. Um, again, low complexity sequence. There's not a lot, especially in this N-terminal region, of charges, not a lot of hydrophobics. And that sequence also allows it to form amyloid-like fibers in vitro and these liquid-like compartments in vivo. And so we wanted to know uh, to what extent can we use our approach to characterize these types of proteins. And so here is the sub-35 protein I just mentioned. Here's its AMFRET distribution. So again, we see a bimodal distribution as expected. We can fact sort these cells. And if we have an orthogonal reporter for the activity of the protein, the endogenous protein, we can see that the cells in the top state have that phenotype. So this white colony color results from inactivation of the endogenous sub-35. The red colony color results from active sub-35. And so we can see that that nucleation event has perpetuated to the endogenous protein at endogenous concentrations. We can take these white cells and do AMFRED again, and we see that there's no longer a supersaturated state, so the bottom population is now gone. And we can take advantage of uh, an endogenous template, so there's another amyloid that normally exists in yeast cells, and we can select that amyloid in different strains that have different nucleating potentials, so interact differently with sub-35. And we can see um, uh, we can change the nucleation barrier, increase the nucleation barrier with different strengths of that template. Um, we then wanted to know, can we understand anything about mechanisms of prion inhibitory mutations or prion accelerating mutations? And so we looked at a wide variety of mutants of SUP35. So again, here's the wild type distribution. These are different versions where the prion domain has been scrambled. So randomly scrambled, we still see prion formation in these cases. Here's one that blocks it. Here's one that reduces it quite a bit. This is just a point mutant that's known to specifically block certain conformations of amyloid. Um, getting back to where I started, can we actually say something about the different contributions to the nucleation barrier? So we used an empirical fit. This is not my expertise, but uh, apparently this is called a Weibull function which fits everything as far as I can tell, has three components. Um, we, uh, so this alpha component uh, is called the shape parameter, and that tells us how steep the transition is. And so again, what we're doing is we're uh, gating the cells into the low fret state and the high fret state, and then just looking as a function of concentration, the fraction of cells in the high fret state. We get some fit or some uh, curve, we fit that to this function. Um, this alpha parameter tells us how steep it is, so how strongly does nucleation depend on concentration. And then this parameter, which is uh, the midpoint of the curve minus the beginning of the curve, or the putative saturating concentration of the polymer, is just a measurement of how the, the width of protein concentrations over which nucleation occurs. And in the crystallization literature, that's called the metastable zone width, or the MZW. And it's determined in large part by the degrees of freedom uh, in the molecule, or the, the amount of anisotropy in the molecules. And so we thought, well, these two parameters should scale differently with our two contributions to nucleation. So alpha, because it's telling us how steeply nucleation depends on concentration, should be proportional to the density fluctuation. And MZW 
uh, is proportional to both, but it includes information about the conformational fluctuation. And so when we look, when we do these fits and we plot alphas versus MZWs, we see that most prions actually fall on a line. Most of the uh, prion forming mutants fall on this line, whereas there's a couple of outliers. Uh, so this one way out here with a very large MZW corresponds with this protein. And again, I said that those mutations specifically block certain amyloid conformers. So what we're doing is we're increasing or uh, decreasing the probability of nucleating an amyloid conformation to begin with, because we've selectively removed some of the possibilities. And so indeed, we see an increase in MZW. Uh, this mutant, this other outlier, is this one, number 24. And this is one of a handful of proteins that, um, that give us a multimodal distribution. So I don't know if you can appreciate it. There's a low population here with no fret. There's our prion population up here. And then there's this whopping middle population, which is non-prion in nature. So this protein actually transitions via two different nucleation events into different self-assemblies. And we reasoned that, well, part of why this is off the line is because there's apparently some off-pathway aggregate um, that's reducing its concentration dependence, or its apparent concentration dependence. Okay, so we took a little detour and wanted to know more about this structure. Does this tell us anything, or this property of multi-phase uh, behavior? Tell us anything about biology? And so we noticed, again, because these are uh, imaging flow cytometry, we have an image for every cell, we noticed that the cells that have this thing were smaller than the other cells. We thought maybe it's toxic. So we uh, plated the cells containing each of these mutants onto inducing media and just looked at cell density. So how, how quickly are the cells growing into a colony? And we find that only this mutant with this weird population is toxic. And this is just the control where the protein is not induced. We took advantage of the fact that, again, there's an endogenous amyloid in yeast cells, and that serves as a template for lots of other amyloids. So we increase the nucleation barrier by eliminating that template. So this is called a pin minus strain. And what we see is that, specifically, this prion population goes away, but this other population stays the same. So this is fundamentally different from a prion-like amyloid. But what that allowed us to do then, um, again, because it's imaging flow cytometry, we can then look at the individual cells in this population versus this population. And we did it in a way where the cells are now allowed to divide. And we reasoned that by quantifying the number of budding cells versus total, we would have a readout for toxicity, a readout for proliferation. And we call that the budding index. And what we found is that, uh, so here's no toxicity. This is just the fluorophore alone. Um, this mutant in the pin minus strain has a greatly reduced budding index, so the cells are no longer cycling as well. And then we can see that that same population here from the pin plus state also has a reduced population. However, what's remarkable is even at higher concentrations, in this case here, the cells are now rescued. So what that means is that the, the prion state and this non-prion nucleated state are um, mutually exclusive. The prion state, once nucleated, rescues cells from the toxic non-prion state. OK, so now we're getting a little more. Actually, do you know how much time I have, Angie? How much? OK. OK, cool. Great. Um, so now we're getting into a little more uncharted territory, but we want to be we're ambitious, and we want to think that maybe we can learn something about nucleus structure or polymer structure from flow cytometry. We want to use flow cytometry as a structural biology tool. Um, and so we surveyed a whole bunch of different prion proteins and plotted the alphas versus MCWs. And again, we found basically they all fall on a line. Here's an example. This is the well-characterized prion rank one. Again, typical bimodal distribution. Um, we know that most of these prions have what's called a parallel in-register amyloid structure. And that's defined by entirely intermolecular contact. So every, every monomer uh, is a single beta strand, or multiple, but in any case, a single rung 
of the amyloid, if that's making sense. So, so there's no intermolecular contacts axially along the fiber. Okay. In other words, the defining interface for an amyloid is inherently dimeric. Okay. Um, we looked at this outlier here, CYC8. Uh, here's its amphret distribution. And I'm not showing you, but the sequence of CYC8 is quite different from these. Um, it has an amphipathic motif right in the middle that at least looks compatible with, uh, with monomeric nucleation. It's large enough, has everything it needs. That's uh, to be followed up on. And then we wondered, is this really unique to prions? What if we look at prion-like proteins? Compositioning will look just like prions, but we know from past work and others that they don't actually form prions. And so we looked at one of these called NGR1 and found that it's way above this line. So it has a much greater dependence on a density fluctuation for nucleation. So here's its distribution. So you can see this is a pretty low region of overlap here. Uh, incidentally, we found now, after getting this result, that nucleation of NGR1 is just rate limited by, or just dependent on density. So if we transiently overexpress the protein and then propagate it for a while and lower it back down, we end up getting a prion. The reason no one saw that before is that there was no, uh, there was no bimodality in the distribution of phenotypes in the population. So once you get up past a certain concentration, pretty much everything looks the same. Right? So you have to go back down to actually see the prion emerge. And then we asked, um, so these are all amyloids. Right? What about something like this that we don't expect to have a large uh, contribution of conformational fluctuations to nucleation? So this is, there's much fewer degrees of freedom in a polymer these death domain polymers, because as it turns out, we now have multiple structures of these, the polymer is composed of monomers that have almost exactly the same conformation. So there's no structural change, rather it's effectively rigid body stacking, and it's a helix, so once you get enough monomers stuck together, you make a full round of the helix, acquire new contacts, which is energetically favorable. Uh, and what we see is that it's the highest alpha of all of them, as expected. So it seems to be rate limited by density, by density change, and not by a conformational change. Okay, so can we test this directly? Um, we took our two proteins, one ASC with the highest alpha of all of them, and we took one URE2, an amyloid forming protein with the highest MZW, and we reasoned that we could um, effectively negate the contributions of alpha by driving the protein into high density. So can we nucleate just by um, increasing local concentration of the protein? And we did that again using this mu and S strategy. We have this multivalent scaffold. So here's the data. Ask, here is without the scaffold, we see this nice bimodal distribution. With it, everything is now nucleated. So this is in trans, right? So we're expressing the, un the, the normal amphoret construct here and then in trans, we're expressing this templating construct. Right. So that tells us that nucleation happened here, perpetuated to the, to the other protein. Um, with the high MZW protein, it had no effect on its own. So you see no nucleation. This is in the absence of a conformational template, this pre-existing amyloid. When we now do it in the presence of the amyloid, we now can drive nucleation. So that tells us that URE2 nucleation requires not only a density fluctuation, but a conformational fluctuation, as expected. OK, now the final little bit. Um, we wanted to know what's the basis of this near linear dependence uh, or quasi-independence of concentration. So, why, so we know from in vitro work that amyloids nucleate within the context of oligomers. If you look in the lag phase of an amyloid assembly in vitro, you see this accumulation of pre-amyloid or pre fibular ligamers. So why don't we see, I mean, why do we have this intersection around one alpha? It's a very low order nucleation event. Um, and what that suggested to us is that, uh, and so in thinking about ways that amyloid nucleation could be independent or somewhat independent of concentration would be if it's a two-phase system. So if the proteins are actually partitioning into a condensate prior to nucleation, for example, partitioning into a liquid phase, 
then you can no longer raise the concentration of protein outside the liquid. All the new protein goes into the liquid. And so then you would have a linear dependence on concentration. And so this is the idea we had. Well, maybe the monomers are actually very low, at low concentrations, already forming colloids. And then from that point on, we're just growing colloids until nucleation happens. And so uh, the prediction of that is that all these prions actually would be forming colloids at very low concentrations. And the fact that um, they nucleate at all, in the case of Uri2, it required high density. That suggests that they are endogenously forming colloids. And so we tested that. Actually, we first tested to see if we can see liquid droplets in these supersaturated cells. So here's our two distributions of SUP35. Here's with the nucleus. Here's without. And we saw that there's a teeny bit of fret. I know it's not convincing. There's a teeny little bit of fret here, even in the absence of the prion. We looked at these by microscopy, and indeed, we see these little spherical droplets, or puncta, inside those cells. We did FRAP on them, so we uh, use a laser to photo bleach the interior of a droplet and watch how fast the protein recovers inside it, so fills in that void. And that tells us how viscous the droplet is. And what we found is it's actually no more viscous than the cytosol, surprisingly. So it recovers as fast as the protein outside the droplet. So it's a liquid. It's absolutely not in some, high, uh, some stable structure. We can watch them over time in a movie, and we see that when the droplets bump into each other, they fuse into one and round up virtually immediately. So they're clearly liquids. Um, and then we knew that from the literature, a lot of people are looking at this phenomenon because it seems to be stress-induced. So you see these kinds of proteins from liquid droplets, in a lot of cases, in response to stress. And so we stress the cells with a variety of different conditions, and we see that that enhances droplet formation. Moreover, we looked at co-localization with other droplet-forming proteins, especially stress granules, and found that uh, these droplets co-localize with stress granules. Right? So it's a combination of lots of prion-like, low-complexity sequences forming these droplets. Now, is it true for the endogenous protein? We couldn't see droplets with the endogenous protein. No one ever has, even though they've looked. So we thought maybe they're just really small. And so we used um, FCS to look at that. So here's FCS of EGFP. Uh, we see 100% of the events have a fast diffusion. Um, we're calling that monomer. When we looked at step 35 EGFP, we saw about 50% of, of the particles are diffusing like monomer, and 50% are diffusing slower. And when we look at the brightness of those, they're actually a little bit brighter. When we do it in the presence of stress, we see that that brightness increases dramatically. So that tells us that these slow diffusing species are not just sub-35 bound to some other cellular structure, but it's sub-35 with other sub-35 molecules. So it's a multimer of sub-35 consistent with our idea that SUP35 is endogenously partitioning into colloids. OK, so we think now this is true. I mean, the distribution, all the prions fell on a line. SUP35 is endogenously forming a colloid. It looks like maybe prion nucleation, at least for a large number of these things, happens within the context of these liquid light droplets. OK, so to summarize, um, we've developed this assay called DAMFRET that we believe allows us to deconstruct nucleation barriers to amyloid and other polymer formation in living cells. Um, we see generally that nucleation exerts temporal control over protein activity. Um, this is used functionally for signaling, cell fate determination, um, and then work from others, memory formation. Uh, and then I think this is where we're heading, is that if it's just a probabilistic event, it must be to some extent related to aging. And then um, death to main polymerization is rate limited by sequestration driven mechanism. So all you need is a <coughs> density fluctuation or something to bring a few molecules together for nucleation. Whereas with amyloids, that's not the case. Amyloids, amyloid forming proteins are often already in a high density state. It's just the incredible improbability of these these conformational changes that give rise to amyloid, that rate limits their formation. And so this is my group. I've been there for about two years at Stowers. Um, Tarek uh, uh, did a lot of this work while I was at UT Southwestern. He started, um, got at least the proof of concept done. Uh, 
And now virtually all the rest of my lab is working on it, different applications, um, screening. This is my funding. Uh, some of my collaborators. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>